move straight away into the the first uh, session of the conference which is the keynote address uh, by professor tim bell and uh, is he uh, a good morning professor tim bell extend a very very warm welcome to you to the ctis 2023 conference uh, before I hand over to you, uh, I would just request a minute to introduce you, although Professor Tim Bell doesn't really need an introduction and is very, very well known to us and has been associated with, uh, with not, not just CTS conference, but CS Patshala and ACM for a very long time. Uh, but I would like to take this opportunity. Uh, so Professor Tim Bell is Professor in Computer Science and Software Engineering at the University of Canterbury, New Zealand. His research interests are computer science education, text compression, algorithms, and computer music. His main area of research is computer science education in schools, and he is in fact a pioneer in this area. His vast seminal work includes the development of the CS Unplugged project and the CS Field Guide. So the CS Unplugged is a collection of resource materials uh, for teaching computer science through games, puzzles, and many other engaging activities. And uh, if, you go, if you have seen his uh, site, uh, students as well as educators can access many interesting materials from there. He has a huge list of publications to his credit and is a widely cited uh, researcher in his field. And he has won several awards. I will mention only two here. Uh, which includes the ACM SIG CSE Outstanding Contribution to Computer Science Education Award and the ETH Zurich ABZ International Honorary Medal. He is actively involved in computer science education not only in New Zealand but across the world. We are very, very honored to have you as our keynote speaker for this morning, Professor Tim Bell. Welcome again and over to you. Thank you. Thank you for the kind welcome that you gave me in the introduction. Um, and especially thank you for the opportunity to, to speak. I always enjoy talking about these things and, and I, I hope we get some questions and we have some you know discussion at the end. Uh, and I do look forward to getting over there sometime. At the moment, it's just not that practical for me, but um, hopefully before long, it will be. And uh, thank you for the warm invitation. Uh, so what I want to talk about, uh, well, what I thought I'd talk about for a while is um, the computer science unplugged material and uh, computer science, computational thinking and so on, but looking at what it's really about, uh, what we can do with it, and hopefully I can relate it to a few things beyond just computer science, beyond just computational thinking. Uh, so we'll see how we go. Um, and I'm aware that some of you are involved in other disciplines, some of you are very much involved in, in com com computational thinking. Um, so let's see if we can have something for everyone. Um, I'm also aware that some of you have probably been using computer science unplugged. Some of you may have used it more than I have. Um, and others, it may be quite a new thing. So I'm, you know, we're going to cover both things that some of you may be familiar with and also some new material. Um, so the Unplugged program is about working away from computers. It's about physical exercise, moving around, uh, students getting to discuss, to, to see each other's faces um, and, and work with each other. Now, it's definitely a good idea for students to have time on computers, to work on a computer um, and, and other computational agents that we'll talk about in a minute. Um, and, and so Unplugged is only a part of the picture, but it seems that it works really well if you can combine working away from a computer with working on a computer. Uh, and of course, in some situations, it's just not feasible to have students on a computer. And that's how I started uh, um, with Unplugged uh, back in 1992. Uh, my son was at school and I was asked to come along and talk about what I did for a living. Uh, as a computer scientist, and I was really trying to think, how can I explain to five-year-olds in a school where there were no computers in 1992 in the schools, um, how can I explain to them what I do, and came up with a few activities which grew into the Unplugged program and uh, worked with a couple of other people, especially Mike Fellows, who some of you will be familiar with, and also Ian Witten. Uh, and uh, turned it into something that has ended up being used quite widely. Um, so, just a, a thought behind a lot of what we're doing is this quote from Albert Bandura, who's 
quite an um, active educationalist, um, and he talked about how um, people have difficulty understanding what's going on in our digital world. The quote says, everyday life is increasingly regulated by complex technologies. And I think whoever is trying to make the audio work properly in that room and the video uh, is dealing with those complex technologies right now. Thank you for doing that. Um, but these complex to technologies, most people neither understand nor believe they can do much to influence. And of course, we, we see all sorts of complex technologies that are changing how the world works, we're, we're, social we're, networks we're, that are affecting how communities interact with each other, um, AI systems that are changing the way that uh, people work and maybe are threatening jobs or even, you know, uh, what it means to be a human. Uh, and, you know, what's going on here? How can we give our students the tools to understand these things and also feel that they could influence them? And of course, the things that, that's fundamentally underneath this is computational thinking, computer science, and those are the these are you know one of the key reasons yeah, 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 that we want our students yeah, to be comfortable coming in that space. Digital system just got carried away again. Right. Um, so let me just talk about computational thinking for a minute. Uh, you know, what is it? What's it do? And um, I think one of the things that's really important when we're teaching things is not just to give definition. I could give you, give you, you know, we'll give you some definitions of computational thinking. But I think one of the key things is more around um, doing and having experiences and then thinking about what that experience meant. And so I'm going to try an experience with you. Uh, and for, this will be particularly easy for those who are online. So if you're online on Zoom, um, I'd like you to get up um, the chat or the Q&A and, &A and um, just uh, I'm going to get you ask you a question and get you to type in the answer. Those who are in the room, you could perhaps just tell the person next to you. Uh, maybe someone can get on the microphone and relay back to me what the, the decision is. But what I have here, and in fact, um, I'm going to do this live on the web um, is these boxes when i click on them they will reveal a number so i'll click on the first one that reveals the number 633 and what we want to do is work out what is the highest number under these boxes and so that's my challenge to you i'm going to click on each one and i want you to at the end either type in or tell your neighbor what is the highest number so we have 633 623 662 600 685, 669, 627, 604, 655, 691, and 670. Okay, so those online can type in what, what you think is the highest number, um, and maybe one or two people in the room, someone could get on the microphone and just tell me what you think the highest number was out of all of those. So someone's typed in 691. Um, and I can see a few people in the room. Maybe you could just raise your hand. Do, do, do you agree? Put your hand up if you agree that 691 is the highest number. Great. Okay, thank you. That's also confirming to me you can hear what I'm saying too, which is a relief. Um, so... That's fine. And, and and by the way, this website and all of the websites I'm going to be working with, um, they're going to be shared with you um, by email afterwards. So um, you'll be able to access them all. They're all open source. Everything that we do around the unplugged um, uh, community is open source. It's available for free use. Uh, and, and in particular, the material I'm using at the moment is designed as exactly for the situation. We, over the past couple of years, we've put together uh, web pages that enable us to interact with people online. This is a particularly large audience, but that's, that's fine. So I'm going to type in 691 and type it in, and it says, yep, we're correct. We found the highest one. Fantastic. Now, that's solving one problem, okay? Uh, and But computational thinking is about coming up with the process. It's understanding the process that you used. So what I would then do if I had a class... I would then ask them to articulate what was the process they used. Because if I reload this page, um, which I'll do, um, then... 
there are different numbers behind these boxes. So the answer is different, but the process for finding the largest number is the same. And normally this would take a while and we, we won't go through that exactly, but normally they, they would start by saying something a bit vague, like I remembered the biggest one or um, and things like that. And then I'll, I'll say to them, well, what happened when I showed you the first one, in this case, 833? And and eventually we can get them to articulate, well, I, I remembered that 833 was the biggest so far. And then when I saw 856, what did you do? I remembered it. Why did you remember it? Because it was bigger than the previous one. Okay, so now they, they're starting to articulate the algorithm, the process that they used, that they compare each number. And if it's bigger, that replaces it. Okay. And through a bit of discussion with students, you you will eventually get to a, a fairly common algorithm for finding the highest number out of a list. Now here it's being pitched as high scores, perhaps in a, in a computer game or something, people's different scores. Um, but of course, it could be all sorts of things. It could be the highest temperature. And, and you know, if we're working, looking at um, weather patterns and so on, we, we might be interested in what is the highest temperature over the last few years, over the last few centuries. Uh, it could be things like um, if we're thinking of pandemics and, you know, what's the highest rate of infection? When, when was the peak of it? And, and things like that. Um, or it could just be a sports competition and, and who got the highest score. And then conversely, the lowest. And it's a very similar algorithm, of course, for finding the lowest. So um, we're, we're very often interested in these kind of statistics. So it's, it's a meaningful algorithm. Um, but uh, what we can do is get the students to articulate this, this algorithm. And, and I've got a version of it here, which is, you know, you have something called maximum so far. And by the way, even just coming up with a name for what you're remembering. So students might say, oh, it's the biggest. Well, it's not the biggest at the start. It's just the biggest so far. Um, and so that the first number is remembered as the biggest so far. And then there's this loop, this repetition for each number. Um, it, it makes that comparison that we talked about. And so we've got students to come up with not the answer to a particular problem, but the process, the general answer for the, the, the problem in general. And that's one of the things that really distinguishes computational thinking is we're interested in general processes, not particular answers. Whereas, you know, in something like maths, um, we might say, you know, solve this problem. Now we have processes for solving problems in maths for um, simultaneous equations and things like that, but it's the same process every time. We're not asking necessarily for students to come up with that process. We're asking them to know how to use it. So the students are the computational agent not the computational thinker in that, that case. And it's still a valid thing for them to do. But in computational thinking, they get to develop new processes. Um, and then what we can do is get them to turn it into a computer program after they've articulated the algorithm, which, by the way, is way easier. You know, sometimes people will just um, put their students in front of a computer and say, write a program to find the biggest number. Um, and they don't really know where to, to start, whereas having it unplugged first, having that discussion, you can see why they can really get it clear in their head about what to do. So here is a possible program. Uh, it's written in Scratch, and it basically does exactly what we did um, in the unplugged exercise. You know, think of a score, um, figure out what the biggest so far is, and here's the critical thing. If the, if the number that someone types in is bigger than the biggest so far, then the biggest so far becomes that answer. Um, and then at the end, of course, we have to say what the result was, because after you've done that, enough, you know, for all the values, then the biggest so far will be the biggest of everything. Thing. And in fact, we've got a scratch program here. We can try it out. Um, it'll just uh, ask for a few numbers. And so if I type in the I type six, we can see the biggest so far is six. I'll type in a two. The max so far hasn't far changed. Far. Type in eight, it's working. And, and in fact, and, um, one of the, oh, there we go. The, so the, 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 the highest value was eight that I typed in. Typed in. Um, 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 one of the big things with, with, with the students has designed a process and implemented it as a program, as a program is that they then need to be able to test it and probably debug it, work out what's going on. What's going on? And debugging is just the difference between what they wanted it to do and what it should have been doing. And so the um, learning to debug is a huge part of it. The idea that most programs will have a bug before you start um, and that students need to learn how to debug them and fix them, that, that's completely normal. Uh, and that is part of being a computational thinker. Okay. Um, 
now on this particular website, we've also given the answer in Python, but it's the same algorithm. And then getting, getting that idea that, you know, once you've got an algorithm, then you understand the process. So, so there's one way of looking at computational thinking. And that, that then just gets us to the question of um, what is computation? And for the answer to that, um, I'm going to turn to Alan Turing, uh, who articulated this back in, um, well, soon around the time of World War II, actually. So, um, you know, getting on for uh, 80, 80, 90 years ago. And he had been involved in developing some of the very first computers. Uh, and at the time, he was trying to work out what is this computation that we've just invented, that we've just built? Um, and the um, result of that was the whole theory of computation and so on, which didn't mean a lot. It was pretty theoretical at the time, uh, but only recently he's been recognized and he, um, his face has been put on the 50 pound note uh, in the UK to recognize you know, what a breakthrough the work that he did was. Um, and one of the interesting things is that his articulation of what computation is is on the 50 pound note. Um, if you go to the UK and get a 50 pound note, then there it is. Um, it's a very mathematical formulation of it, and it's done in terms of finite state automata and stacks and um, tapes and things like that. Um, and it's really interesting to go into, but not probably for uh, younger school students. Um, the way we would articulate it is, is a little different. We'll get to that in a minute. Um, but one of the interesting things is I asked some of my friends in the UK to send me a 50 pound note because um, I'd like one to you know stick on my wall um, since it's got computation on it. And uh, they said, well, they wouldn't mind sending one to me, but actually you hardly ever see them. And the reason you think about why people don't use 50 pound notes in the UK now is that um, payments are all digital. And so ironically, you know, the father of the computer, Alan Turing, uh, was the person who prevented people from celebrating what he achieved uh, with the 50 pound note. Um, now, in terms of what computation is, uh, it's generally expressed in terms of what we call a complete language. Um, and, and this is an idea that Turing came up. And in fact, we now call them Turing complete languages. And what it says is that for something to be a real computer, it has to have six elements. And this program that uh, matches what you just would, were doing with the high score has those six elements. So one, is the, one of them is the ability to have a sequence of instructions. And the sequence starts from the top, goes through to the bottom. Pretty straightforward, and that's quite easy to work with, even with relatively young students. Um, another important idea is what's technically called selection, uh, the idea that you can have an if statement, that it can make a decision, um, to, in this case, either to re remember the bigger number or not. Um, then the idea of iteration, which is looping, be able to do things over and over. And that's really powerful because although that says repeat it four times, it's going to you know ask you for four more numbers, you can change that to four. 4,000 or 4 million, and the computer will just do it 4 million times. Um, and that's some of the power of computation, especially the fact that the computer won't complain and it will do it extremely fast and so on. And so um, where I'm getting to is that if students are aware of these six elements, I'll give you the other three in a minute, then they have access to the full power of computation. And sometimes it's easy to get stuck on, say, just sequence and get them used to, to working in sequence and just, um, you know, learning to give instructions one after the other. Um, that's important, but no matter how big their sequence is, it doesn't mean they've learned a lot about computing. It's when they start combining each of these elements that they really tap into the power of computation. Now, the fourth one uh, is input. Um, a computer has to get input from the outside world. Um, which leads us naturally to the idea of output. It has to be able to send output um, and then so that people can see what's happening. And then the other really important thing is the ability to store values. Um, and, you know, this is a reworking of Turing's work. Um, it's called the Structured Program Theorem. Um, you don't need to know that, but this is the reason that having access to those six elements means that students have full power over computation. Uh, in New Zealand, in our curriculum, it's actually structured around those six elements uh, in that at younger ages, students can work on sequence and maybe they do a little bit with iteration. Uh, and by the time they're around about 10 to 12 years old, um, they would be expected to have use all of those. 
Now, it's not just knowing what they are, of course, it's being able to put them together accurately and to achieve a particular outcome. So, um, but that's what we mean by computation. Uh, so if we go back to the definition of computational thinking, um, Jeanette Wing was the person who really made it uh, famous, brought it to the fore. Uh, you know, and she said, well, one, she gave several definitions, but one of them is that it's the thought processes involved in formulating problems and their solutions so that the solutions can be represented in a form that can be carried out by an information processing agent. So what I was saying before, you know, it's about coming up with a process, not just with a particular answer. Of course, there are many processes that will achieve the same thing. There's actually an infinite number of algorithms uh, for finding the largest value. Some of them are better than others. Um, and there's certainly an infinite number of programs that someone could write um, to do that. Uh, but so it's not that there's one right answer, but there are good answers and not so good answers. So the information processing agent is an interesting thing because when, when we get into unplugged, the information processing agent is usually a child. And so a lot of the unplugged activities that we have for them to do um, involve restrictions. Now, the one that we just did then, um, which you know involved... Now, I was showing it to you online. By the way, please don't do these online with students. Instead of these boxes here, what you would have is a card on the table and you flip over the card and then flip it back or it might be a number in an envelope. You take it out and show it to them and so on. But it's physical and it, um, it's away from the computer and that's um, you know the, the most effective way of doing it. But then the student has become the information processing agent and but they've got the opportunity to reflect on what were they doing when they solved that problem and how can they generalize it. Now, another definition of computational thinking that Jeanette Wing used was that it's just thinking like a computer scientist, which doesn't help a lot of people to understand what it is. How does a computer scientist think? But for me, it was really interesting because the whole reason I started doing this was because I was asked to speak at my uh, son's class because I had to explain what a computer scientist does. And I wanted them to understand what sort of thinking uh, a computer scientist is involved with. Um, now, the an another definition, uh, which I quite like, is, is that it's problem solving where the solution is a process. We're coming up with a process for solving the problem. Now, here's yet another definition, and you may have come across this one, and sometimes people latch onto one definition. I, I, I hope that you will be aware that there are just many different angles for defining things. They're all the same thing, but different uh, purposes, different approaches. And um, this definition, you may have seen it um, particularly in the UK, it's used a wee bit, where it just says computational thinking is made out of about half a dozen skills, um, algorithmic thinking, abstracting ideas, decomposing, and so on. It's just a different angle for looking at that. And these are great skills. Um, and in fact, when if you look at our unplugged material online, we have explained how each of those skills comes up in each activity. Right? It's not that one activity covers one skill. Um, what we just did before Obviously, there's algorithmic thinking, but there's also abstraction. What you know, we're abstracting the general process that was done. Um, there's decomposition. We're breaking things down into pieces. You know, what happened first, what happened next, and so on. And so that's just another angle that we can take at thinking about what is computational thinking. Now, I want to take a slightly different angle now and think about um, programming, and in particular. Um, the idea that we don't write programs for computers, which might seem a surprise, but in fact, we write programs for people. And I think a really important aspect of um, computational thinking is being aware of the person that will be using your system. Now, um, I'm gonna do a small exercise with you now, and um, it involves a thing called the Stroop effect, and it's a very drastic um, example of human computer interaction about how um, how computers can frustrate people. And it's actually quite a good way to sell it to people who have used computers a lot and do find them frustrating because computational thinking computer science is very much around looking after people and then uh, you know helping them to get their task done. And so I'm going to go to another online exercise that we have um, and the, the way it works is I'm showing you a word, but the word is wrong. And what I want you to do, just quietly under your breath, the answer is to this is it's red. Okay, so you just you, you, when you see this, you say red, 
Um, when you see this one, you would say black, and when you see this one, you would say green. Okay. Um, now I'm going to put up some colors, and um, what I'd like you to do, they're, they're incongruent, the color is different to the word, is just quietly say to yourself the color, not the word, but what the color is, and at the bottom, there's a timer here that um, says zero seconds at the moment. When you get to the bottom, just notice what that timer is. Now, it's not a competition to see how good you are at this. In fact, if you are good at this, it might be a worry. Um, but it's really a matter of seeing how bad it is to have this contradiction in place. So <clears throat> if you're ready, I'm going to start it off and just note what the time is at the bottom. Those who are online, you could type it in, type in the time into the Q&A. Um, and for those in the room, maybe um, we'll ask one or two um, what their time was. Okay, so here we go. Right. Hopefully most of you have... Um, excuse me, got through the list by now. Um, so just type in roughly how long it took. I, yes. 13 seconds. Yeah. A few people took about 13. Anyone do it? And you can put your hands up, actually. I can see some of the group. How many people did it in less than a, 10 seconds? About 12 seconds, some people. Yeah, about 13 um, online, someone said 18, right? <clears throat> Excuse me. So, um, yeah, we're looking at about 18 seconds for that. Now, the second part of this experiment, and it's, it's actually quite a well-known psychology experiment, is I'm going to give you the, the same challenge, except that the colours will be congruent with the words. The words and the colours are the same. Um, so here we go. Right. Now, did anyone take less than eight seconds? Maybe just put your hand up in the room if it was less than eight seconds for you to, to read them. Quite a few, yeah. Anyone less than six seconds? One or two? Okay. So maybe that took you, you know, about seven or eight seconds. Um, haven't got any answers online at the moment. Oh, yes, I have. Three seconds, yeah. Um, it's a lot simpler, isn't it? And the point here is that when you um, when you don't try and trick the person who's, who's reading it, it's a lot faster. Great experiment to do with students. Again, you would just put this on paper. You don't need any computers to do it um, and time it with a stopwatch or something. Uh, but you, then you can do some statistics on it. It's good maths exercise. You know, how much slower is it? And generally you'll find for most people it's about two or three times slower if they've got that contradiction. Incidentally, if um, English isn't their first language, it's actually easier for them to get the colours right. Um, so it, it's important to do it in, in the main language of the person who's trying to read it. Um, but where we're heading with that is that we're talking about interfaces and looking after people. And here's an interface that we used to have in New Zealand for booking airfares, for booking a flight. Um, you would type in all of the flights you wanted and, and put in your credit card and details and be ready to book it. And just when you've nearly finished, and you have to do this quickly or else you might time out, um, it, it says, do you accept it? Which button do you press, the green one or the orange one? And a lot of people press the green button because it's asked a question and they would think green means go ahead. Now, in actual fact, the button says start over, which is not very helpful. Um, because people would lose all of the work that they'd done and be quite frustrated with the, the system. And then if they went back and complained about it, a programmer could probably have said, well, you pressed the button that said start over, so of course you lost all of your work. Um, and But that's not the point. The point is that the system was not designed for humans in the same way that that experiment we just did was very annoying. Now, designing good interfaces is definitely not all about having the right colours and things. Um, it, it, and here's an, a, quite an old dialogue box, but it's, you know, it just says, do you really want to quit? And a choice of buttons, OK, I'll cancel. And I don't know if any of you have had that experience, but, you know, which one is the right one? What should I do? Um, is is it does cancel quit or does it mean cancel the quitting and so on? And you can probably work it out. 
but it's just slowing you down for a couple of seconds when you're trying to get on with the job. And very often computers give more work to the person who's using it instead of doing the work for them. And, and that's a point that we want to get across. Hmm. Now, so, you know, I'm sort of looking at a couple of angles and um, the whole idea of computational thinking. And the next thing I want to look at um, is the idea of um, the sto uh, storage. So you remember that there were six elements um, to what makes up computation. And one of them is storing uh, data. And to do that, um, what I've done is I've um, grabbed a copy of uh, this picture here, uh, which I think is probably uh, what is used in the uh, logo for the CETIS uh, conference. And it, I think I saw it at the front of the room there. Uh, so this is just a photo. You can put in any photo into this um, web page, just drop it in and I'm going to zoom in on it. And of course, after a while, we start to see that a, a photo is actually made up of pixels um, or picture elements. And if we zoom in a little bit more, um, we can see that each of these pixels is actually stored using three numbers. Now, <clears throat> those three numbers are labeled R, G, and B. And uh, you may have come across that, the idea that we use red, green, and blue to specify a color. But the reason that we use red, green, and blue is uh, one is basically comes down to biology because the human eye has red, green, and blue sensors in it. They're called the cone cells. And so this is something that relates to um, you know, part of science. Um, and, and the idea that we can make colors by mixing red, green, and blue. Um, and that yellow color that we had, I, well, see, when I turn up the red here, um, that's been transmitted to the other side of the world, and it's stimulating the red sensors in your eyes. Okay, which is why you're seeing that as red. And if I turn up the green, then I'm stimulating the green and the red sensors in your eyes, the cone cells, and your brain interprets that as yellow. Uh, and in fact, if I add the blue into it, um, all of the cells are being stimulated and that comes across as white. So that's how we make the white color. And then of course, if it's only red and blue, we end up with um, versions of purple and so on. But basically, any color displayed on a screen is some mixture of red, green, and blue. They are the primary colors, um, they, and they're the additive colors, because screens start off black, and we add color to them. But it's a very human thing. The human body is capable of detecting red, green, and blue. Well, actually, not everyone. So 8% of males, the red and green sensors aren't always working correctly, and so they're red, green, colorblind. Now, getting back to interfaces, that means that we need to be sensitive to that and not use red and green for anything too important because 8% of males won't be able to tell the difference easily. Um, but also, really, it's just coming down to that we don't design computer systems for computers. We design them for the person that's going to use them, and that's where the red, green, blue comes from. So if I go back to um, the, this image that I zoomed in on, um, I'll perhaps pick a more interesting pixel. Um, you know, up in the top left hand corner here, we've got um, 245, 159, 1. Um, so if I set this to 245, um, 159, and 1 for blue, um, then I have reproduced that color. And in fact, that's exactly what's happening. Even when you're watching this video of me, my computer is capturing all of the pixels from the camera, converting them to those, well, those, basically storing them as those numbers, sending them through the internet uh, in a compressed format, and then they're being decoded at the end so that you're perceiving them as particular colors, millions of pixels, megapixels um, at once. But that's giving us a little bit of an insight into what's going on inside the computer. Um, and Going back to that quote from Bandura, you know, we want students to understand and feel that they can influence these things. Now, what can you do now that you know that a picture is just a bunch of numbers? Well, that's where, um, so for example, uh, this is a picture of Arnold the Wonder Parrot. He's the mascot for Unplugged. Um, he's got a green screen behind him. And in fact, if we zoom in on, on Arnold, um, a computer doesn't actually get to see those colors. It just gets 
to the um, the numbers behind it. And so how would you write an algorithm, a process, for Arnold, okay, and in fact, we can see up here, for example, this top left-hand pixel here, it's got green as a hundred. So that's probably part of the green. And we'd have to write an algorithm that runs along this row of green pixels until here we get the, oh, yep, up here, the, the red value is now getting quite high and red and green mixed together um, like that will give you an orangey color. So that's the parrot, the orange, whereas back along here, it's mainly green and that's where the background is. And that's how green screening works. It's, it's just looking for those numbers. And once again, we're almost getting back to a similar algorithm to the one we were doing before. You know, where is green at its brightest? But it's a bit more complicated because the other two values have to be low. Just giving some insight into, you know, the, the processes, but also the storage, um, the way that the data is represented. Um, and then, uh, in fact, these numbers have to be stored, and one of the unplugged activities that's really popular and quite effective is teaching students how to represent things as binary numbers. Now, we've traditionally done this just using these cards uh, with 1, 2, 4, 8, and 16 dots on, uh, and what that does is it means that relatively young students, it's a very physical thing, each card is either visible or not vis visible. can either be a group of students at the front and the whole class are um, telling them what to do, or it could be a set of cards that the student's working with and they're flipping them over. The, the reason it's, it, it enforces that it's binary is you can either see a card or you can't. It's the, that's simply what binary means. Um, so I've got an activity here. Now, normally we'd start by asking the students how many dots there are on the card, one, two. They would normally think there's three. We just tell them it's four, and then they'll probably find the pattern. And remember, one of the ideas from computational thinking, being aware of patterns, and this is a really important pattern in computer science. Um, we can keep on adding these um, dots. Normally they get carried away looking at those, but most of the exercises can be done with just five cards. And I would start by saying to them, you know, very simple rule, we can either see a card or we can't, flip it upside down, and I would like exactly 13 dots. And so I ask them a series of questions, and we could do this online, but I think I'll keep things moving. Um, so, you know, if I want 13 dots, should the 16 be visible? No. Should the 8 be visible? And then they can look at it and think, oh, yep, I'll, I'll, if I want 13 dots, then I have to have the 8, and I have to have the 4, don't want the 2, and I do want the 1. And now we've shown exactly 13 dots, but their answer to that question was no, yes, yes, no, yes, in terms of do you want to see that card? And now we have a binary representation. Just by saying yes and no, we've communicated the number 13, and we can do that for other values. Um, and so, you know, we end up with this idea of binary digits, um, or of course, for, for short bits, which is the fundamental unit of storage on computers. And in fact, when we um, get to um, uh, representing other things like you know letters of the alphabet, we end up with numbers going from here 0 to 31. Well, there's 26 letters in the English alphabet, so I can represent a letter of the English alphabet to you. Um, but the um, other thing that we actually had before was this number here for the red color. It went from 0 to 255, which of course happens to be a nice, um, you know, easy to represent number using eight bits. And so all of these things are coming to connected together, but why do we use eight bits here? Well, eight bits is convenient for computers, but also if I move these the slider up and down by about, you know, a value of two or three, you probably can't see the change in color. So it's representing it more accurately than your eye can see. If I only had six or seven bits, probably it wouldn't be accurate enough and, and people would, you wouldn't end up with high quality pictures. So, you know, we've gone from the bit to how people perceive things to the biology of the eye and so on. Um, all of these things are connected, um, but it is all about people. Um, one of the, you know, I, I mentioned that we don't just do unplugged on its own, but we try and connect it with computation. And one of the things that um, we have on our unplugged website is exercises that enable students to connect the thinking they were doing offline with programming online. So here's a scratch program that works out the number of dots on a card. You know, it sets the number to one, 
Um, and then it just keeps on doubling the number of dots. And so, you know, that, that's articulating the process that they had gone through for, for doing that. And there's a whole lot of exercises relating to connecting with the patterns in binary numbers. Um, but I just want to take a different tack because the other thing is that, you know, I'm enthusiastic about this stuff and I suspect that you're pretty enthusiastic, but how do we get people on board? Um, and one of the things I've found is that the unplugged material is great for really quick demonstrations. This group of people here are senior officials in the New Zealand education system. And in fact, the woman with the pink jacket on was the Minister of Education. Um, and I happened to be giving a talk and they came in to see what was happening. So I invited them up to do this exercise. Now, none of them had much experience in computational thinking or anything like that. But when they did the exercise, they got really enthusiastic because they could understand it. It only took a minute, two minutes to, to get the exercise going because the rules are very simple. And they really understood the difference between computational thinking and just getting students using computers, teaching them how to use a computer. Um, and so one thing is if you are dealing, you know, we end up with this, this, this thing where you have people at the grassroots who are really enthusiastic and people um, in politics who probably want to do the right thing, but they haven't got time to figure out what it is. And I've found that unplugged demonstrations can be a really good way to engage them and help them to understand um, what that sort of, uh, you know, what really is involved in in genuine computational thinking in, in the kind of stuff that we want students to get enthusiastic about. Um, I will, we'll, yeah, we'll try one more exercise, and this is because um, one of the things about unplugged is it's also about things that are right under our noses that you know we think that we might not be able to understand, but we but actually could be understood. Um, and I'm going to do an exercise um, with product codes. Um, so hopefully Sonia's there. I've I asked Sonia to to pick an item with a product code on it. She, uh, she probably has there. Yeah, that's great. Um, and. Again, normally you would do this exercise on the on the blackboard or with paper, but since um, I'm sort of on the computer, I'm going to do it here. Now, what I would like you to, if we've got a volunteer there or someone who can um, just read out the product code on the uh, the product that Sonia has there. Have you got someone to do that? Yeah. Oh, thank you. Um, and what I'd like you to do is read out all of the numbers, all the digits, but not the last digit, okay? And my job is to try and guess what the last digit is. Um, so, yeah, let's, let's hear what the, the di digits are on the product. So, Mike, it's working. Uh, I haven't got sound at the moment. Oh, here we go, okay. Yeah, we just start again, thanks. That's good. Yeah. So, we have eight. Nine. Oh, no, actually, I don't have sound now. First digit was 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 The first digit was eight. I'm just going to mute my mic and see if it works. If you uh, if you start talking. Uh, nope. I'll, I'll tell you what, if you've got a blackboard there, um, we could just write the numbers on the blackboard because um, I, I can see the blackboard, especially if we zoom in a little. Um, so I want all of the numbers, but not the last one. Let's see how we go with this. Now we're, we're very high tech. Hopefully, we had some chalk. Right. If we have some chalk and it's possible to write it on the blackboard, that that would do the job. Yes, we have chalk. Wonderful. Uh, are we audible? Uh, yes, you are. Hey, 
So we have our first digit is eight. Eight. Nine. Can you please take the chat box? Is there a chat box? So I have eight nine zero. One zero. 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 One. Four two. Okay, and um, and one more number. Oh, sorry. Nine. 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 Okay. That's fantastic. We can uh, mute the microphone at that end now. Now, this actually illustrates it really well because I don't know if I heard that properly or not. Um, but what we're going to do is try and check whether I got that number correct. Um, and the, what happens is on those product codes, um, there's a calculation that's done on every product code internationally. And what it does is it multiplies each alternate digit by 131313. So 8 times 1 is 8. And again, normally I'd get the students to do this. Um, 9 times 3 is, well, it is 27, but I'm using modulo 10, so I'm only interested in the last digit. So instead of 27, I'm going to say that 9 times 3 is 7. Um, 0 times 1 is 0. 1 times 3, 3, 0. 6 times 3 is 8. Kids kind of enjoy when you say, you know, 6 times 3 is 8. It's a bit simpler, perhaps. Um, and we've got 0, 1, uh, 4 times 3 is 12, so just the 2, 2. 9 times 3 is 7. And then what happens, and this has happened when the barcode was designed, um, is you add up each of those digits. Um, and again, I just emphasize, normally I would do this on the whiteboard. I wouldn't be using a computer, but it's just easier in this circumstance. Um, so 8 and 7 is 5, right? Modulo 10. And 3 is 8, 6 and 3 is 9, 0, 4 and 7 is 1. So I think... Those numbers all add up to something ending in one. And the question I asked the students at that point is, what, num what can you add to the one to get a, the number zero? And, and of course, they'll start by saying negative one, but they say, no, it's a positive number. And then they realize that, you know, nine plus one is zero in this modulo 10 system we're using. So I think that the last digit is nine. Um, now, uh, was the last digit nine? Um, maybe you can give me a thumbs up or a thumbs down. Um, Um, can't quite see. Yes, 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 yes. It is. I'm getting a thumbs up. Fantastic. Now, that is actually a wonderful illustration because I really wasn't sure if I heard it properly. But I probably did because if any of these digits, if I'd heard this digit, I don't know, um, if I thought the zero, if I thought she said one, then I would have added it up to one and this number here would have been a, uh, a two, and so it would be eight to add it up. And I would have said to you, that last digit is an eight. And of course, you'd be going, no, it's not, it's a nine. And that's how I know that I made a mistake or I didn't hear it properly. Now, of course, in a shop, when you scan that product code, that's exactly, that calculation is done every time. It checks that it's worked. And if, if it doesn't add up, it means there's something's gone wrong with the scanning. Uh, maybe there's, you know, a, a bit of ink on it accidentally or something like that. And that's, um, but that idea of um, being able to check the value, and um, it's called a, a check digit, um, is really common and it's it's quite widely used. Um, so, um, you know, other, it, it, things like uh, the products, but, you know, tickets, bank accounts, passports, all sorts of things like that um, use these check digits. So, for example, um, in New Zealand, if I type in a bank account, and I type one digit wrong, then it comes up in red on the screen. Um, and this one in green, it's it's a correct bank account. Well, at least it it, it actually probably isn't a correct bank account, but um, it, the check digit works. And students can explore how many mistakes you can make and how you know two mistakes could counteract each other and you think it's correct and it's not correct and so on. But it gives us a lot of security that when we're working um, with digital data, that we know whether or not that data has come through accurately. So um, a whole lot of exercises you can do with that, but it actually ends up with the students doing a whole lot of mathematics and arithmetic and exercises um, and, and exploring. There's actually a bit of algebra in there about how many mistakes can we make uh, and the error won't be detected. 
So just to, to recap, I um, want to think about, you know, what are we really trying to teach with computational thinking? Are we teaching coding? Well, not really. Okay, coding is one of the products, and it is a skill that's great for students to have it. Um, are we teaching foundational skills? Well, yes, we are helping them with things they might be doing later on. Um, are, are we developing their self-efficacy? I think that is an important one, that we're helping them to see that they can understand this world that we live in, that they're starting to see bits of it, and it's in a way that they can make sense of it. But I think most of all, we just want to give them a vision for what they can do, that they've heard of this thing called programming or computation and so on, and they're finding out, is this something I can do? But we've removed some of the barriers that um, that you know we have when we're working with uh, physical computers, um, and we're giving them a, a ramp up to, to be able to, to do that effectively. So I, I hope, and, and this is, I think, what most teachers are, are on about is that we're trying to give our students a vision. And yes, there are particular skills that it'd be really good for them to have. But if you can focus on get, giving them a vision for what they can do, what, what their passions are, what they would like to be able to do, which might not be computation, but it might be, but at least they know what it is and whether or not they're good at it. Um, so that's, that's the main thing that I wanted to get across. Um, the material um, that I've been working with is on these two websites, but as I said, we'll send out some specific links afterwards. Um, and hopefully we've got a little bit of time for questions or discussion. Um, we may have to type some of the questions if the microphones are playing up, but uh, I'll, I'll hand over to you. So um, thank you very much for your time. Yes, that's really good. Oh, thank you. I, I, actually, that's a really good question. Um, I hope I heard it correctly. So what I, what I heard was, um, you know, with things like maths, we have a particular advanced level that students are expected to get to. Um, but with computational thinking, what are we aiming for? Um, and um, I think, you know, part of it comes back to, to what I was just saying, that, that we, we want students to, you know, have a, have a vision. Um, but... To do that, I think one of the keys is um, those six elements of um, what makes computation. Uh, let me just bring it up. So it's, it's not that they need to know these words, sequence, iteration, selection, input, storage, and output, but they need to have worked with those elements in computation because that's the essence of computation. Um, that the way that they can have worked with it, you know, for example, storage, it could be flipping cards and binary, things like that. Um, sequence for young kids, it, it may be following instructions to move around a grid or something simple. Um, but in terms of programming, um, my view is that once they get to the end of their sort of compulsory um, curriculum, which for us in New Zealand is probably when they're about um, 13 or 14 years old, after that they, they're still in school, but they're going to start specialising perhaps in science or arts or um, you know, some other subject. Um, but once they get to about 13 or so, it would be really good if they know how to use those six elements um, effectively. 
um, that's not as simple as just saying learn those six things. It's it's about having that experience of working with them in different contexts and so on. Um, once they've got to that point, then I think they've got that complete vision of what can and can't be done with computation. Um, and and then if they've got enthused, by all means, go on and specialize and look at all, you know, there's so many other aspects to look at about how you can use those to make really interesting things happen. Yeah. Hopefully that, that helps address that question. Okay. So, sorry, I didn't quite hear that clearly. I, I might be a wee bit far from the microphone, but if someone can either just repeat the question or get them. Uh, right. Yeah. Um, yeah. Activities that can integrate with other subjects and so on. Um, so absolutely, um, at the junior level, actually, on the um, Unplugged website, um, which is uh, here, it, it actually does have a section um, here called Curriculum Integrations, um, and there are ideas here for integrating it with, with other parts of the curriculum. Um, that's at the junior level. Um, in terms of other resources, though, I, I know there are specific ones, like there are books about how to integrate it with music, for example, um, how to integrate it. Um, in science, there's some amazing opportunities because you can uh, use small devices like a microbit um, to do measurements. They can measure acceleration and movement and so on. Um, and so, you know, the students can write little programs to either record data from an experiment or even to run an experiment like you know, to, to time things, to make things happen every so often, um, which gives gives them a lot more power. So, um, you know, thinking of ways to use computers, um, uh, it, it kind of needs to come from within the discipline a bit, and I'm not really aware of places where you can find that at the more senior sort of school level. Um, I think it's sort of quite a new idea, and it's also really dependent on what devices you have available. One thing that can be done in, in a general situation is simulations, you know, writing a simulation program um, to, to simulate um, whether it's, you know, viruses spreading or objects moving under the influence of gravity and, and things like that. Because when students write a simulation, they have to think what are, you know, what is happening to the um, actors in my simulation, to the the, the molecules or the planets or the, the, um, the people that are you know, getting infections and so on. Uh, and so that can be a really good way to, to integrate the two. But the students, to do that well, um, they do need those basic skills that we were just talking about, you know, that, um, be able to have the full power of programming um, to do that. So there's a little bit of an answer there, but actually I think it, it's something that people, you know, would do well to, to, you know, work on more resources for that sort of thing. If you know of some, I'd love to hear of them too. Right. Um, sorry, at, at what stage we should start implementing? Uh, right. Yeah, really good question again. Um, the, 
I think the for me the answer is that it it, it it's one of the it, it's like language. Um, if you learn language when you're young, it is a lot easier. And we know that up to about 12 years old, um, students can learn languages much more easily than when they're older than 12. Um, doesn't mean you can't do it after 12. It's not that it's too late or anything like that. But if you can reach students before they're about 12 years old, before they reach puberty, um, it it does seem that they are much more open to new ideas, to new ways of thinking and so on. And it's good to get the basic ideas then. Now, the basic ideas might be some of the unplugged material, uh, programming in a language like Scratch. I'm not saying that Scratch is necessarily the appropriate one all the time, but, um, you know, doing some simple exercises and so on. Um, just, again, so that they can start to develop the language and the attitude. And bear in mind that it's not just programming, it's debugging. It's knowing that there will be bugs. Um, it's knowing how to find the bugs. It's knowing how to, you know, design things so that they're easy for people to use. And just developing their self-efficacy, developing their sense that they could actually do this. Um, so it's not so much when is the right age. I think it's just what is appropriate at each age level. I don't think we need to push them really fast or really hard. Um, we just need to let them, you know, get to know the language, the culture um, around computation so that it's just part of their world and, and that they're comfortable with it. Mm. Um, yeah, I'm sorry, I, I, I can't hear it very well. Um, but maybe if someone can repeat it into the microphone. Um. Yes, that's great, thanks. Right. Yes. Um, I wish I could give you a really good answer to that, but um, greater minds than mine have, have worked on this and, and do have some good ideas. Um, and I think a lot of it is that we need to focus on uh, learning skills that, that students know how to learn, um, not, not that they learn particular things. Um, and so it's kind of the next order up from 
Uh, and, and, you know, we are doing that to some extent, but that we're, we're teaching them how to learn, not just to learn particular things, uh, because the reality is the world will be different and there will be things that they're using that we none of us have heard of at the moment. Um, on the other hand, I think it's also important to realise that things don't change as fast as they might seem. Um, and part of the reason that I brought up about Alan Turing is that, you know, he, he was working in the 1940s on computation and the limits he found for computers still exist today. Now, it might change in the future with quantum computing and, and things like that, but pretty much most computers, and, and by computers I mean digital devices and cell phones and tablets and so on, have exactly the restrictions that Alan Turing knew about. Um, and so there are some fundamentals uh, that that will stay. And, and of course, one of the things that we get a lot in, in computer science is what programming language should we teach students. I'm pretty sure any language I teach a student in 10 or 20 years' time won't be a useful one for them to know. But the fact that they've learned it and that they've learned how to debug and they've learned what, um, you know, how computation works means that they can adapt very quickly. So, uh, you know, I think a lot of it is helping them to adapt as well. Um, it's 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 not a probably a great answer to your question, um, and there are many other aspects to that. But um, and in fact, one that I would emphasise is social skills is a really important part of it. I mean, traditionally, people have said if you haven't got social skills, then maybe you could work with computers. But hopefully, I've got across the idea that if you're working with computers, you are working with people and you know multiple people. Uh, you are developing software that many people are going to use. Hopefully, millions of people are going to use your software. So, um, you know, having that ability to empathize with people, to understand them, having diversity on teams, work, being able to work with a variety of people and um, deal with people with different opinions and, and different approaches, I think that those are the kind of skills that are going to be really important um, to succeed in, in, in the digital world and the world in general. I hope that was the question you asked. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. 